6,919,377,000 of us live on this tiny planet, and only a few of us can see the connections, the patterns, mathematical in design, are hidden in plain sight. Just have to know where to look. The Great Pyramid at Giza is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This magnificent construction is the only one of the original seven wonders that still remains standing. This is a story of disturbing questions and unbelievable answers. A story that challenges everything we know about the history of our planet. Building the Great Pyramid was an astonishing achievement. There are eight major feats of engineering involved in the building. First, the builders leveled the ground and cut a 6,000 hectare bedrock to fit many strangely shaped slabs, each one as heavy as a car. Second, they carried 130 granite blocks over 500 miles. Each block weighed between 12 and 70 ton. The blocks were hauled up 210 feet, an achievement which even today would be a challenge. Third, the Great Pyramid has three chambers inside it. With breathtaking precision, the builders cut a passage through the solid rock, 300 feet long by three feet wide to reach the lowest chamber. Pierre Luigi Coppet, an architect who helped create the Berlin Potsdamer Platz, seems surprised. The descending passageway was narrow, so the working conditions would have been terrible. Keeping the tunnel at exactly the same angle would need special tools. You would need precision tools throughout the whole building process. Fourth, the builders worked with more than two million pieces of stone, all of different shapes and sizes. This makes accurate building much harder. In spite of this, the upper chamber is perfectly horizontal and vertical. The builders got it right to within a fiftieth of an inch. This is a feat any modern structural engineer would envy. To build things so accurately such a long time ago is, is I mean, it's frankly amazing. And even now, I think most people would say it would be too difficult for, you know, for most builders to, to get anything like that accurate. And it worked. The Great Pyramid stayed intact through earthquakes that flattened everything around it. Everything was in its proper place and nothing had moved inside. Fifth, the position of the Great Pyramid is absolutely precise. It points north within five hundredths of a degree. We only learned to do this recently. In the 17th century, thousands of years after the pyramid was built, they couldn't come close to that degree of precision. Sixth, the Great Pyramid actually has eight sides. Building an eight-sided pyramid is even more complicated than building a four-sided one. To keep this eight-sided base on the four sides of the edifice during the build, with an accuracy down to a centimeter, even down to a millimeter, 
this would have been extremely difficult. If we wanted to build a structure like this today, even using all the modern measuring devices and building techniques at our disposal, we'd still be in real trouble. Seventh, they worked at speed. Egyptologists think the pyramid only took 20 years to build. There are over two million stone blocks in the pyramid. If they work 12 hour shifts, 365 days a year, they'd have to quarry, carve, lift and fit one block every two and a half minutes. And finally, since the ancient Egyptians didn't have wheels, iron or steel, the seventh wonder of the world was built with copper chisels, stone mallets and hemp ropes. So, 4,700 years ago, when the rest of the planet was still wandering about in animal skins, the ancient Egyptians flattened a limestone hillock, paved an area the size of six football pitches, piled up two million blocks of stone to the height of a 42-story building, drove a narrow 300-foot-long passage utterly straight through the rock, fitted the stone in the inner chamber with complete precision, built the outside of the pyramid with eight sides instead of four, and made it earthquake-proof. Lined it up precisely with magnetic north, and got the whole job done in 20 years using only these. You might think the Egyptologist is overwhelmed by written evidence. This is true for some periods, but for others, like the ancient empire, we know very little. And that's why, finally, your questions are ours. When it comes to the building of the pyramids, we have a lot of theories, but no written account. The pyramid is thought to be the tomb of the pharaoh Cheops, although we have little historical information about him. As with all the Egyptian pharaohs, we don't have any proper historical records. There is evidence in papyrus and carved into the rock, but no one can agree on what it means. There is no agreement among Egyptologists they look at the evidence on the ground and sometimes conclude one thing and sometimes another. So if the historians and Egyptologists can't tell us how the Great Pyramid was built, maybe we should ask geologists, stonecutters and engineers, men with technical know-how, the people who do these kind of big projects in our own time. In the 1960s, engineers raised the Abu Simbel Temple to keep it from being flooded by the Aswan Dam's water. In spite of cranes and trucks, it took five years to quarry and rebuild this temple made of 2,200 blocks, some weighing 30 tons. It was a huge achievement, but nothing compared with building the Great Pyramid. This clay quarry in France is roughly the size of the Great Pyramid. It took 12 years to fill it, and all they were doing was dumping rubble. They didn't have to build a thing. Maybe it's time to think the unthinkable. Maybe the Great Pyramid isn't a tomb. Maybe it was built for something else. There are other sites in Egypt where blocks of uneven shape and size are used for building, but nobody knows why. For me, 
This remains a complete mystery. Without cement, those are rough stones laid side by side. This is breathtaking. These are tremendous achievements. A razor blade couldn't fit between two blocks. They're so precisely laid. It can't have been easy. Heavy blocks like that haven't been put back in place any time recently. Here the blocks are irregularly shaped, but they're a perfect match with the blocks on the other side of the corridor. A mirror image. So they can't have been set as they came, using whatever irregular shapes came from the quarry. They must have been carved into these shapes on purpose. There must be a reason for it. If you want your monument to stand strong, it needs to be heterogeneous. That will keep the wall from collapsing in the case of stress, like in an earthquake. Since there are no modular blocks, there are no crack lines. The blocks fit into one another, which makes for a strong wall. So the builders of the Great Pyramid over 4,000 years ago knew how to make their work earthquake-proof. Eric Gontier sums it up. Objectively, from my own observations on the ground, each time I checked a pyramid systematically, everything had to be reconsidered. Maybe there is also a reason the Great Pyramid was built with eight sides, even though building with four sides is much easier. Close to the Great Pyramid, there is a black bedrock. Today it's ignored or used by tourists as a picnic table. But take a closer look at these grooves and cuts. Compare this to rocks cut by modern machine tools. The similarity is staggering. On the other Egyptian sites, there are unexplained holes. These match the sort of thing we do today by machine. No one today could do this kind of thing by hand. Five hundred miles away from the Great Pyramid is the quarry where the red granite to build it came from. This is an unfinished obelisk left in the quarry. It's 126 feet tall and it weighs 1,300 tons. It's hard to imagine how this could have ever been transported from the site. The tools used in this quarry are supposed to be simple stones. Simple stones used to make holes like these. The work involved would be incredible. The Colossi of Memnon, here in Egypt, are the heaviest statues on the planet. So it must be possible to make them with simple tools, because that is all we had at the time they were built. 
It's a circular argument, and circular arguments get us nowhere. There are no records of how these amazing structures were built, but Egyptologists say they're absolutely certain they weren't built by machines. The next impossible thing Egyptologists propose is that the Great Pyramid was built in only 20 years. Christopher Dunn is an engineer who makes high precision machines. He studied the huge statues at Luxor. The Ramses statues at Luxor are incredible in their design, they're incredible in their execution. These are very, very complex shapes. And so we're going to look at just how complex are they. Chris Dunn analyzed the statue of Ramesses the second's face and found it was completely symmetrical. What we see is that this jawline and this jawline are identical. In fact, that is unbelievable. To create the condition where one side matches the other, they had to have had some system of measure to be able to make sure that they were cutting the material properly and that they were achieving the geometry that they desired. This is not the result of somebody going at a piece of granite with a chisel and chiseling a face out and saying, OK, that looks like a human face. This kind of condition does not happen by accident. As we see, you can des describe a circle that actually f conforms to the outline of the face. But now you've got to remember that the circle is in 2D. But the jaw jawline is coming forward in 3D. So it's very complex geometry. And the same on the other side. And now we'll start to look at the other features of the face. The eyebrows, lower eyelid, upper eyelid, the lips, and the approximate curve to the mouth. We can use circles again to describe those features. And all the circles that are used here are the same diameter. Other heads also have the same geometric scheme. Even with modern tools, this would be incredibly difficult. What was guiding the tool? Because the human hand is not that precise. So it had to have assistance. And today, we have mechanical assistance to guide tools to cut complex shapes and contours. What I present in, uh, in telling you about the precision of the objects is just to present the facts as an engineer, what I have measured. Um, in terms of who did it, why they did it, and when it was done, uh, other specialists need to answer those questions. It's impossible to believe that however careful the craftsmen were, however slowly they worked, that they could achieve such astonishing results without complex tools. It's hard to see how they were built by hand, using only chisels and lumps of rock. Nobody uh, can determine what tools we used. We can theorize. But essentially, when theorizing, we have to show, we have to be able to demonstrate. Egyptologists still insist all the statues, temples, and pyramids were built with chisels, ropes, and stones. Egypt isn't the only place in the world where irregular stones were used in ancient buildings. There are nine other ancient sites around the planet where we can see this technique has been used. Not far from Nazca, a pyramid has been discovered. There may be 40 or more of them, but the site hasn't been properly excavated yet due to lack of funds. And that's not the only thing Peru shares with Egypt.
There are mummies here and misshapen skulls similar to the skull of Akhenaten, the Egyptian pharaoh. In Cusco, there's a giant wall built by the Incas with the same irregular building blocks we saw in Egypt. We see the same thing again at the Sacsayhuaman site, the irregular construction technique that makes these buildings withstand earthquakes. You shouldn't underestimate how much effort is involved in preparing the surfaces of each of the blocks. Despite the fact that Peru is a place where earthquakes are very, very common, many, many structures built far later with modern technology vanish into dust, and these stones are still standing. If you plot them on a map, this site with Cusco and another sacred site, Kenko, form a perfect triangle. I couldn't explain with certainty why these distances in hectometers or kilometers match up with other sites in the world. But the proof is there, so there might be a reason. Throughout Peru, ancient sites like these are filled with spectacular constructions. Just lifting these rocks up a slope like this was a real challenge. Nowadays, we could lift stones of 10 tons to a, a, a reach of maybe 50 meters, to a height of 100 meters with very large cranes. But I mean, that's a huge piece of contemporary technology. What's amazing about it is that we couldn't do it now. And this was 500 years ago. If you imagine the Egyptians, When we visit Machu Picchu, we get a sense of how sophisticated the Andean civilization was. Most of the population, the Cusco Valley's inhabitants, didn't know what Machu Picchu was about. These beautifully crafted walls in Machu Picchu are strikingly like the buildings that surround the Great Pyramid in Giza. Here too we see the symmetry in the building style. This has got to be more than a coincidence. In all these ancient sites, we find the same building techniques, the same huge scale of building, and the same precise orientation with the compass. Just look. This is where the comparison with the beavers falls through. Because even if they build the same dams, they don't line them up over thousands of miles. Even if these ancient people did communicate, it wouldn't explain why the sites are on the same straight line, and why that line is at an angle of exactly 30 degrees to the equator. And the mystery doesn't end there. In Mexico, just like in Giza, there are three main pyramids. They are the Sun Pyramid, the Moon Pyramid, and the Pyramid of the Feathered Snake. And just like in Giza, the main pyramid is precisely aligned. What's amazing is that the Sun Pyramid, like many other constructions like it, were built to indicate precisely the phenomenon that we call the equinox. However much the experts deny it, 
The similarities between all these ancient sites are striking. Hieroglyphic writing, mummified bodies, great astrological skills, earthquake-proof construction techniques, We need to look harder at these questions if we're ever going to find the real answers. Any material that man, mankind hasn't managed to invent, a single material which lasts as well as this stuff, it's amazing, but we haven't done it yet. These ancient sites are full of questions and mysteries that conventional archaeology cannot answer. And anyone who steps away from the usual explanations is dismissed as a crank. But the questions remain. Because rock carving cannot be accurately dated, there are no definitive answers. If we want to solve these mysteries, we need to keep an open mind. The Great Pyramid at Giza is in the center of all these ancient sites. Maybe Egypt holds the answers. It's time to go back to the pyramids, remembering what Sherlock Holmes taught us. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. In Egypt, a researcher who wished to remain anonymous gave us a trail to follow. The ancient Roman, Pliny the Elder, tells of arguments about who built the Great Pyramid. But of all the accounts that Pliny writes about, only one has survived. Herodotus' account is the only one we have left that tells us about the building of the Great Pyramid. It shows how little we really know. In 1859, an Englishman, John Taylor, discovered if you divided this dimension by this one, you got pi, the mathematical formula. This caused controversy at the time, some people thought it was an accident. Could it be a coincidence that these particular dimensions give us pi, one of the building blocks of mathematics, science, and engineering? I asked my anonymous Egyptian researcher if he could explain why these dimensions were significant. Because the half perimeter is the biggest horizontal visible dimension and its height is the biggest vertical invisible dimension. Pi is not the only significant number in the Great Pyramid. If we look at the dimensions of the various parts of the pyramid, each part can be multiplied by a whole number to give the total height. The surface of the four sides divided by the surface of the base equals the famous golden number, one of the key principles of aesthetics and design. The golden number is unique. 
These equations work with the golden number and only the golden number. The golden number occurs all over the natural world, in the shapes of plants, in astrology, in the proportions of the human form, in the proportions of great art. The golden number appears to be a constant in the universe. By dividing the half perimeter by the total height, we get the golden number squared. And the golden number occurs again and again in the Great Pyramid. Ancient builders worked with a precision that modern architects would envy. Their achievements have never been better. All this can't be chance, because everywhere you look in the pyramid, you come across pi and the golden number. It's found in the visible pyramid, and it's there in the upper chamber. This is a controversial position, and many in the archaeological establishment would strongly disagree. It seems extremely unlikely that Egyptians knew the value of pi. The golden number was also a relative unit featured in pyramids and their temples. But it never occurs in Egyptian calculations. So this knowledge of the golden number is very surprising. Many Egyptologists say the ancient Egyptians had no great mathematical skills, and all this number stuff is just coincidence. But here's a mathematician's opinion. We meet it so often that the probability of it being due to chance is nil. It is infinitesimal to me. Frankly, it's like zero. It stands to reason, even for a mathematician, meaning someone who can assess probability that the volume of that pyramid was picked because of its numerous possibilities to reveal through it the golden number. I think that ancient Egyptians were aware of the golden number. They couldn't have come across the resolution each time, especially the perfect one. They had to possess that knowledge. It's not in their culture to divulge it. They kept it secret. And the best way to keep a secret is not to convey it anywhere. It's no secret. It's simply closed. Geometry is the sensitive part of mathematics. And just like mathematics, it's a language. The golden number, or golden ratio, often occurs in classical architecture. We can see it in great buildings like the Parthenon and many of our medieval cathedrals. Like the Great Pyramid, this cathedral shows the equinox. This circle indicates precisely the position of the sun on the horizon during the equinox. Even more extraordinary, 
the shape of the Great Pyramid is hidden in the facade of Strasbourg Cathedral. Even though, when the cathedral was built, the Great Pyramid was still partly covered in sand. The builders of the Great Pyramid certainly knew what a meter was. They used it with pi and the golden number to determine the length of the cubit. But the mysteries don't end there. The anonymous researcher we spoke to earlier had been plotting the ancient sites on a world map. This strip that stretches from Easter Island to Giza is actually part of a 25,000 mile long circle. This 100 kilometer wide circle goes through many significant ancient sites across the globe. In Peru, it passes through the Paracas drawing, the Nazca tracks, Olantitambo, Machu Picchu, Cusco, Taxiahuman, and the Paratuari pyramids. In Africa, it crosses Mali and the mysterious Dogon lands, where they knew the stars Sirius B and C before any astronomers. Algeria and the Tassili Nijar with its painted Martian god. In Egypt, it goes through the Siwa Oasis and its Zeus Amon temple, and through the Great Pyramid at Giza. Next, it crosses Petra, Ur, where Abraham was born, Persepolis in Iran, Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan, where the unreadable writing was found that is so close to the writing on Easter Island. Then it crosses sites that have always been known as the homes of the gods, Kachuroho in India, Paye in Burma, Sokotai in Thailand, Angkor Wat and Prahihar in Cambodia. And it ends with the most isolated and mysterious place on earth, Easter Island. There is an astonishing accuracy to this alignment. Although many of these sites date from different times, most were built on the ruins of more ancient sacred sites. At some remote point in the past, someone had built a series of sacred sites on this line, circling the globe. The circle was as long as the equator, but the mystery doesn't end there. If we take this circle as an equator, then its north pole would be located here. And the triangle formed by this point, Nazca and Giza, exactly matches the shape of the Great Pyramid. The distance between Nazca and Giza equals the distance between Teotihuacan and Giza. The same is true of the distance between Angkor Wat and Nazca and between Mahengo Dara and Easter Island. The distance between Easter Island and Giza is 10,000 times the golden number. The distance between Angkor and Giza multiplied by the golden number equals the distance between Giza and Nazca. And the Giza-Nazca distance multiplied by the golden number equals the Nazca-Angkor distance. As surprising as this seems, it ties in with some earlier discoveries about the pyramids. In the 20th century, an astronomer and priest, Moreau, showed the meridian passing through the Great Pyramid divided the land of the Earth into two equal surfaces, making Giza the central point on the planet. Twenty centuries before him, Agatharchides argued that the Great Pyramid was the geographic reflection of the Earth. And the length of the two sides of the Great Pyramid was also the average distance a point on the equator moves through space in one second. This is a given in physics indicating the speed of the rotation of our planet on its axis. Every aspect of the Great Pyramid is stuffed with significant numbers that connect to the world. But many people find this hard to believe. Skeptics argue that this could all be just chance. But the number of amazing facts that have to be explained just keep growing. 
Once again, we have to return to the pyramid for further investigations. Let's take another look at the inner chamber. Each building block here weighed as much as 40 cars. Each block had been fitted precisely. They are perfect vertically and horizontally, even though the builders didn't have the tools to check their exact measurements. Why did the Egyptians build with such precision? There's a reason to bring huge granite blocks 500 miles to Giza. Granite has one unique property. It doesn't change over time. Its dimensions remain the same. This means the Great Pyramid secrets could be transmitted through the ages. My anonymous friend drew two circles, one outside and one inside the base of the pyramid. He subtracted the length of the inside circle from the length of the outer circle. Take this figure to a physicist. That's odd. That's the speed of light. No doubt about it. This is the speed of light. In millions of meters per second, this is the number from the pyramid. I have nothing else to say. Scientists may find these truths unpalatable, but they are hard to deny. Are they embarrassed by these revelations? If we look at the Great Pyramid without prejudice, with a fresh eye, and when you're a physicist, you measure and you notice many things like that. Coincidences, I suppose, but so many coincidences with such a big object, it's very disturbing. Many experts would argue there's nothing extraordinary here. They say the Great Pyramid really was Cheops' tomb. Even though no one can explain how it could have been built in 20 years, they say if the Great Pyramid really is signaling the equinoxes, if it really contains pi and the golden number and has a cubit value that relates to these and expresses these values in meters, it's all just chance. They say the striking similarities between the ancient sites thousands of miles across the world is just another coincidence. If these sites line up in one line across the world, that's a coincidence too. And if interesting numbers continue to crop up, in the distances between the places, and if the Great Pyramid contains the number for the speed of light, it's just chance. How many coincidences have to happen before you look for another explanation? This is starting to look less like chance. Or maybe there's a rational explanation for these mysteries. Maybe it's not chance. Maybe once we look beyond the conventional histories, there's a new truth to be discovered. If none of this is coincidence, then who is responsible? Given the possible natural disasters that could occur on Earth, for example, continental drift, volcanoes, or major meteorite impacts, there's nothing to keep us from saying that more advanced civilizations might have lived on our planet. So it's possible a more advanced civilization once lived on our planet. This is a bold and radical conclusion. And of course it raises more questions. Why are there no traces left of these people? If, for some reason, our civilizations were to disappear, many things would withstand centuries, but not millennia. Only a few big monuments would last. Monuments, I would say, like the big pyramids in Egypt. What then is left of this advanced civilization? We know they measured the Earth. They built a scale model based on it, in the shape of the pyramid 
full of numerical significance. They built a series of artifacts along a line that circumnavigated the world. There must be a reason for all this. Everything we have discovered about the Great Pyramid must have been put there for a specific purpose. We are very close to discovering the truth. Megalithic sites occur all over the world. Is their placement random? Or does the location of these sites reveal yet another hidden layer of ancient knowledge? One thing I've found looking at uh, different megalithic structures over a few continents and numerous places around the world, overwhelmingly these places, the pyramids, the stone henges, etc. of the world, were placed on ground where an unusual type of geology naturally concentrates the regular daily natural electromagnetic fluctuations that occur everywhere on the earth each day. If you go into England, for example, um, the, the ley lines that cross uh, England, the Michael line, which is hundreds of miles long that crosses England, um, that carries this energy along that line. It will therefore generate uh, electric currents in the land called telluric currents in the straight geological sense of that word. And um, those occur everywhere on the planet. But we know that this ley energy, this subtle energy passes along these lines. There are certain special types of geology that will magnify those several fold. And that's what we're, where we found the megalith builders preferred to put their, uh, their monuments. And typically where lines cross, where you have more than one line intersecting, uh, temples were often built. These are called conductivity discontinuities, which sounds highly technical, but it's merely the place where one area of ground that has a, a good ability to conduct electricity meets another area of ground that has a lesser ability to conduct these natural electric currents. The Chinese had the same tradition. They call them dragon lines. It was illegal for a commoner to be buried on such a line. A king had to be buried on such a line. They put palaces there. There's a whole series of sacred sites they're always built on lines like this. I want to say in this area about the uh, location of temple. And you have to have a, a symbols appear on the ground. When it's uh, uh, seen, then this is the place where people naturally come to get more uh, healthy energy from that spot. You know, energy pops from the earth. And it appears as though they were attempting to control the flow of this energy and use it for their own purposes. The key hours, unfortunately, are the pre-dawn hours. If you really want to study this, you've got to get up at 3 and get out there very fast. Um, that's because the, uh, the energy that is involved in these sites, that's really fueling most of it, originates with the daily changes in the Earth's geomagnetic field. Uh, it's strongest during the day, weakest at night. And in the hours leading up to dawn, the weaker field lines now come roaring back to closer to full strength very quick. It's the most dramatic time in terms of change of magnetic strength per hour. It's the most dramatic time of the day. And wherever you have uh, a changing magnetic field occurring, you, you are generating uh, electric current in anything present that will conduct electricity. It's a simple principle of physics known as induction, and, it, and it's a universal. Normally, in everyday life, we don't ever see 
large concentrations of this energy. Normally, it'll show up at the say, at mountaintops, at sacred sites. You'll feel a certain calm, a certain peace. Sometimes people in those places uh, report mystical experiences. They'll see into some other dimension. Okay, they'll see into some other time. The Chinese have known about this for a long time, and they call it qi. The Hindus, in their ancient texts, call it prana. And the yogis, with the maintain a very ancient tradition, um, use it. It affects a, a variety of different processes. Electricity and magnetism has a strong effect on that. So it modifies all the other laws of physics. When you look back on how sacred sites were chosen, and uh, buildings like the pyramids were, were constructed, the suspicion arises that they understood quite a bit more about this stuff than we do, and they may have been using it in their engineering. Then, the megalith builders designed these structures and, and then built them in such a way as to further concentrate those energies. So they definitely seemed to have known what they were doing. so much joy for the world and the system meaning the record companies totally took advantage of it but this is very important what we're fighting for because I'm tired I'm really really tired of the manipulation I'm tired of how the press is manipulating everything that's been happening in this situation they do not tell the truth, they're liars. And they manipulate, they manipulate our, they manipulate our history books. The history books are not true, it's a lie. The history books are lying. You need to know that. You must know that.